Everybody ready? Yes. yes. All right. We've had a feast for the eyes. Now it's time for the ears. Now we've had our local resource. Now it's our regional resource. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. David Horowitz, who has come to us this evening all the way from Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> yes. Along Dr. with, <laughs> along with uh, a, a friend who is the chairman of the board of the Oklahoma Jazz Hall of Fame, That's right. who wanted to hear Jewish jazz. Uh, all right. And so we shall. Dr. Horowitz has an impressive and lengthy medical resume. I'll just give a few little bits from it. Uh, he is, among other things, the fellow of the American College of Chest Physicians, the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. The list is incredible. Now his music resume. He is the bass clarinetist for the Tulsa Community College Community Band and Orchestra. He is a member of a 10-piece clarinet choir and, most thrillingly, in the 1980s he started a klezmer band called the Klezmets. <laughs> Great, yeah? So, with his extensive knowledge and experience, we're going to get to hear a little bit about the history of klezmer, where it comes from and why, and you can take notes if you like, if you don't have to. <laughs> and you get a presentation, actual live music, played in this room for your enjoyment, with a guest performance also including Richard's son. Yes, this, this is an incredible array of things we have here. So, <clears throat> without further ado, please welcome Dr. David Horowitz. Who suffers through no fault of his own, 
And a Nebuch is a person who suffers because he makes others, other pro people's problems his own. An old joke explains the distinction. <laughs> the Shlomil spills his soup. It falls on the Shlomazel, and the Nebuch cleans it up. <laughs> anyway, um, I wanted to, uh, uh, for those of you who find this late, I can give you the cliff notes. It's uh, Click Lesmer is the traditional dance music, secular dance music of Eastern European Jews. You heard that style of music in Fiddler on the Roof, and as we'd say, the rest is commentary, go and learn. Um, the origins of Klezmer. It comes from two Hebrew words, clay and zemer. Uh, clay is a, a vessel of, and zemer is a song. So it really was, it, it really um, meant a, a musical instrument. Eventually, it became known for the musicians who played it. And the, according to a number of records, uh, historians, there's no real recording record of anyone who, there was no style of klezmer music. It was always called Yiddish or Jewish music until uh, uh, the uh, until about uh, uh, 30 or 40 years ago, when when the, the genre actually started to be uh, known known as klezmer, the style, and it's a very unique style. Um, first of all, it it um, it represents. The, uh, the, the cantor or the chazan's voice in a synagogue, but it's totally secular. So the klezmer musician learned to, uh, uh, to, to imitate uh, a, a, a cantor in a traditional synagogue during religious services, even though this is totally secular. And the, uh, uh, the style would be to make Make the audience want to laugh and cry at the same time. It was a very, it was a very emotional kind of music, and um, uh, if you hear uh, um, uh, opera singers, they'll always uh, yeah, da, 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 yeah, da, da. there's almost they always cry to it. That's what the that's what the klezmer musician tried to accomplish. Um, it. Uh, uh, it, it, but, but there were little things that, that added to it, and that is uh, what we call drebuch, little, uh, little elaborations. So that um, um, the, what I was playing before, instead of just playing the piece, uh, So 
these musicians were the most mobile of Jews. Most Jews lived in uh, in their own ghettos or, or shtetls. And although, uh, you know, from what we see in movies, and we think that uh, all of European Jew Jewry lived in these little these little hovels and these little towns, but that's not really true. There were there were Jews who lived in large in large academic centers, and many of these musicians were conservatory trained. Many of them uh, were trained by their own family. It was a family, an intergenerational business. Uh, so the Klesmer bands uh, made, were made up of uh, grandparents, great grandparents, parents, kids, and they would learn the style. Um, the uh, the younger Klesmers learned songs from the older Klesmers, um, and the the uh, there were there were non-Jewish uh, folk songs that these musicians played uh, from Romania mostly, Ukraine, and the Ottoman Empire. Um, so I mentioned there are Klezmer dynasties, these were Klezmer dynasties. Uh, but there were several breaks in the history of this. The first is uh, a mass migration from Europe to America. And that changed things. And the second was the Holocaust. Um, there were uh, millions of people who spoke Yiddish in, in, in Europe. And uh, after the Holocaust, of course, the, many that, that number that number diminished. Uh, transformation of the music from from Europe to America changed. The, the, the immigrants wanted their their music, and with the development of the first recordings in the late 1800s, there were these ethnic labels of people playing Jewish music. So you had uh, you had these old klezmer bands. I'm going to play I'm going to play some of these in a few minutes. But I'm going to do the talk first. Um, they uh, they, uh, they, they wanted their own music, but over a, after a while, this seemed, the interest seemed to fade. And uh, um, in, in the 21st century, most of the music was learned by uh, fake books. This music was never written down. It was always passed on, again, from generation to generation. And uh, um, the, um, uh, once the music was, was written down, people would then uh, be able to play it exactly the way it was written, uh, which was a problem because um, the musicians, the Jewish musicians, uh, and same with the records. Before that, uh, it was uh, people would develop their own songs, their own style. And here, the new immigrants in the United States said, I want to play like, like that musician or that band. So it became much more stylized than it was earlier. Um, the song types. Um, there were there were there was a definite structure, and unless there are music majors here, I'm not going to go over the details of this, except that there were um, uh, the, the the common endings for these were often uh, um, were were often. Uh, It's an eight fifth, eight fifth, one. Um, the, uh, that was the standard ending for fast tunes. Um, the uh, the other thing that was unique is that that there'd be an A part, and then a B part, and then a C part, and then it would repeat to the B part, and that was unique in in in, uh, in stylized music. Normally, you play A A B B C C. Or A A A B B C C A B C or A A B B C C A, and this was very this was very unique. So what were the types of music? Well, freilichs were fast music. There was uh, circle dances, and and you know if you've seen Greek Greeks dance, it's it's probably very similar to that. Romanians, uh, the music from Fiddler on the Roof, where they were dancing the fast, that were, those were freilichs. Essentially, happy, happy songs. Um, the, uh, then there was a share. The share was mostly a Russian, uh, Russian dance. And remember, these are these are all folk songs. So these musicians learned the regional folk songs of their region, and they were more mobile than most Jews. So they would go from town to town, 
And uh, they, they, of course, many of them didn't have a great reputation, so there was some tune about lock up your daughters at Class Wizard Club. Something like that. Uh, uh, the, uh, they, they, would, uh, uh, they would play um, one style of music, but, uh, but they, they would alternate uh, major, major, major texts of tones with minor tones. And uh, the, uh, the, so the songs would be happy, and then it would sound sad, and then it would go happy again. Um, the share was like a Virginia reel. There are actually, there's, the, I, I, there's a, a, a Tulsa International Dance Club. And uh, the band I played with, played for them one, once or twice. They use records, and I've been to some of their dances. Uh, a share is really, the, you know, Two, four, six, eight. You know, you, they, you bow to your, your partner, you bow to your corner, and you dance. And eventually, it ends in a scissor dance and a snake dance, where where instead of it being in a group, they would uh, everyone would be in one line, and you'd go underneath and around and so forth like that. Um, a husadol, probably a filter on the roof. If I were a rich man. Da -da 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 that was a, a husserl was that style of, of music. It was it was named after the Hasidic Jews who danced it. Uh, it was there were still embellishments, and it was usually danced in a circle. Um, a hora, or a zok, a hora was actually a Romanian hora. The, the beat was one three, bum 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 bum, and it would just go on and on. That just a a a, a uh, a, uh, a, uh, it's, me it's mesmerizing because it just continues that same beat, and the musicians just play on and on. And I'm going to play. I'm going to let you hear one of those. A Turkish was like a habanera, uh, and it took its its meaning from the Spanish Jews coming coming into uh, to um, um, to the eastern eastern Europe. My name is Horowitz. And a physician at a national meeting said, hello, Dr. Horowitz. And I said, no, it's Horowitz. He said, no. He said, all the Horowitzes come from a rabbinic Levi family that left Spain and settled 40 kilometers outside of Prague and took the name of the village or the, the mountains, which was H-O-R-O-V-I-C-E. It actually exists. It was a friend of mine took a picture of the train stop. So um, anyway, in Eastern Europe, in all these years I thought I was Ashkenazic, and now I've been lately trying to learn Ladino music, <laughs> Spanish and Portuguese and uh, French and Northern African. Um, anyway, um, it's really a habanero, bump, 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 and there was a dance, there was a style of dance, and then there were mazurkas and polkas. Uh, chardash, uh, you know, but with the, again with this little cracks, this little extra notes that made it typically Jewish. What about the instrument instrumentation? Um, uh, the sounds were really um, uh, instead of the, the typical sounds um, of uh, like a like a scale. <laughs> Major. Minor. These were uh, more harmonic minor and phrygian. Um, the, uh, um, it, it, sounds, it sounds different. It's very distinct and uh, it follows a, a distinct port, uh, chord progression. Um, uh, and it's different from vocal Yiddish songs, which, uh, which sounded different mostly uh, mimicking or Russian folk songs as opposed to these klezmer sounds. If you're a traveling musician or a group of musicians, you're not going to be able to carry a piano. You're not going to be able to, um, uh, to carry a double bass all the time. You're going to want portable instruments. So initially in the Middle Ages, the 1500s, 1600s, early 1700s, uh, the main, the leading instrument was the violin. And then there were other violins that, that backed these, the lead instrument up. Uh, violas, maybe small cellos. Um, 
there was uh, something called a poik. It's a, a drum that, that was uh, like a bass drum that was uh, strapped on with a, a cymbal on the top. So someone could do this and keep rhythm. Um, uh, in the early 19th century, um, uh, strings and uh, uh, had something called a cymbal, which is a hammered dulcimer. I have a, I have a, a sound on this that I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, and, uh, uh, but then, clarinet was invented. Clarinet was originally a, shaw, a, uh, uh, a, a piece of wood with a reed and holes. And then uh, uh, Albert developed a system of keys, and then it evolved to the bone system, which is this system. And uh, the nice thing about this is that the same fingering is a saxophone and a, and a flute. So most, that's why most, most uh, uh, clarinetists can double on the saxophone and flute. And uh, actually, these musicians were really the first, um, the first club date musicians because they had to, they, they, uh, they didn't just play uh, the life cycle of the music of the Jews, that is, bris, um, the wedding, of course, and they had to be, as like I said, they had to be noble. So the wedding could go on for days and in different rooms. So you had to go for, to be able to play in one room, and then you were outside in the courtyard where the ceremony took place, and then you were in another room where the food was. Um, the, uh, so the clarinet evolved in the 17 and 1800s and became the lead instrument of choice. The violin became the backup instrument. And then, um, and, and you can appreciate, you can hear with, with these, these instruments uh, that I'm going to play, you know, we can do all kinds, we hate squeaks, we squeak sometimes, and we hate sharps and flats, but this kind of instrument is perfect for this kind of music. You know, that, and, Into the early 1900s, 
Ukrainians banned loud instruments, so they weren't allowed to play play um, uh, brass instruments. Uh, they had to play strings. In, in 1855, Ukraine then permitted loud instruments. The brass came in again. Uh, the clarinet replaced the violin as the instrument of choice. Brass instruments, military, and uh, and thus uh, you had the, uh, the the night is for for this, these expanded uh, this expanded bands. Um, the, uh, uh, the mainstream culture adapted this music. Uh, people who were Jewish who composed music, for instance, had this in their, in their mind, in their soul. Uh, they would heard it. So, for instance, uh, you know, Leonard Bernstein, uh, Aaron Copeland uh, were influenced by these klezmer idioms. And much of Benny Goodman's clarinet styling, he never played klezmer music although he did play for a wedding of a friend. But the style of his music was definitely that of, uh, of, a, Jewish, of a Jewish soul. Um, in the, the 1938 or 39 uh, Carnegie Hall uh, uh, performance of uh, Benny Goodman's band playing, Jew, uh, playing jazz for the first time to the, to the elite, um, uh, Ziggy Yeoman, uh, who's, I forget his real name, it was, a, it was a much more Jewish day than Ziggy Owen stands up after Martha Tilton sings and the angels sing and plays the real freilich, the real sound of this, and then they go back to the swing. And uh, uh, in the late 1970s, there was a klezmer revival. I mentioned that until, until then, klezmer, real klezmer music sort of faded out. It became like Hava Nagila, which is really an Israeli piece, at weddings and bar mitzvahs. Um, in Tulsa, don't tell anybody, but if we play Jewish music, unless you start with Hoffa Megillah, no one gets up to dance. <laughs> and then we go into other things, we speak other things at all. Um, uh, my music teacher, who was a very busy, prolific commercial saxophonist and clarinetist, who also was a klezmer clarinetist, uh, he and several people uh, have a, 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 a CD, I think it was a tape, and it was made a CD, uh, produced by his daughter, who was a, an entertainment lawyer. And uh, it was the lost Jewish music of Philadelphia. And the interview, <laughs> the interview people who were these old timers play, and they would say, oh, if you played in South Philly, you had to start with this piece. Because if you started with that one, no one knew it. You had to start with this one, and then we would play it to others. But if you played in West Philly, that was a whole different gig. You had to start with this piece, because that was the whole thing. And then if they served the hot soup, we had to tone down and we played slow stuff, etc. So we were interesting. Um, so in the 1970s, there were a number of young Jewish uh, musicians who wanted to explore uh, their roots. And um, uh, one of these was uh, was uh, a, a fellow who was a, a music major at uh, Boston Conservatory of Music. And his uncle had, was a klezmer musician in Philadelphia. And he had tons of this music, these arrangements, original arrangements in the attic. And he, uh, he found this stuff, got a hold of musicians who were Jewish and non-Jewish, who were interested in, uh, in, playing, uh, in learning and playing this. Don Byron, who's a very prolific jazz musician, is a black, black jazz musician. And he's fabulous at playing this klezmer music. Anyway, so the Tulsa, the, uh, the klezmer conservatory band came in too, as well as several others. And there was also a, a clarinetist, bass clarinetist from the Tel Aviv Symphony Orchestra, Gloria Feidman, who also uh, developed a re reconnected with, uh, with um, uh, this kind of music. So he, he and several of these other, Andy Staten was another one. And, uh, and then in the 1980s, there was another revival. So music you currently hear, they, they fused with modern, with modern jazz and fusion jazz and, and going off in, in all kinds of directions as the older klezmers did before music was written down. It's just that they uh, have a different style. So, you know, in, in, for instance, um, uh, in, uh, uh, in George Gershwin, you know, there's 